Hey everybody, welcome to the channel. Today we're back on our 650. We've got our handle pull all done. We're gonna work on our ignition system and hopefully we're gonna to try to ride this thing today. Here we are, we're at the starter relay. We've got the battery positive hooked to this brass piece here. We got the negative going to the ground, battery ground. One side of the starter relay is gonna provide all your power to the rest of the ski. This is the very first thing we wanna check and make sure we've got power to. And the way we do that is we take and we short these two together hear that click that's a positive sound this is a power wire here this is a return back from your start switch we can take our start switch here and we can hook it up this is the very first circuit of the ski here and then we hit the start button that's a good sound if you have that sound that's gonna be the first step to the rest of your ski you are basically powering a little electromagnet in here that pulls a plate and brings these two pieces together now the copper can get corroded to where when it brings these two pieces together there's no amperage coming off of this post. You always be aware that when you do this test you'll put a voltmeter on here and make sure your voltage is carrying otherwise it'll be a bad starter relay. So we're going to go ahead and install this starter relay. Here's our cover for our starter relay. You see there's a spot there for the battery and there's a spot there for the starter. The spot for the battery is always the one that has the post that's populated. We have a rubber insulator and then we have a plastic or a Delrin insulator and that stops the electricity from shorting across this aluminum case. So that goes there, that goes up through there, and then we have another piece of Delrin plastic that we'll put down there and we'll put those down across there and we're good to go. You see we got the starter relay installed. We have our ground running over to our, where our rectifier is grounded through this box. We have our engine from the stator, our ground wire is grounded. This is, where the, this is where this box gets its ground from, is through the stator wiring back to the engine. And we have the start switch hooked up. So now we have a very distinct, that's a very distinct sound. That's good. So what we're gonna do now is we're gonna hook the starter up and see if we can't get this thing to turn over. Okay, motor turns over. I left the spark plugs out so it doesn't drain our battery or burn up our starter because we're going to be cranking this over a little bit. The starter's good. Starter wire's brand new. I haven't put my battery wire on yet, but we're just trying to get this moving forward as far as we can. The next thing is we're going to develop some kind of spark. So let's go find an igniter. So we found a CDI here. We got a wire hooked to the stator. We got our ground. And we're going to see if we have spark. No spark, huh? Wonder if we need a better ground. Let's try something else here. Try a different ground here, see if that works. There's our ground. There's still no spark. So we'll have to do some troubleshooting. This is our CDI we were just messing with. We've got our ohms at 1.8 mega ohms. That's a lot of resistance. So what I'm wondering is if maybe our wires are bad. So I'm gonna try something here real quick. I'm gonna cut these off here. So I've cut the wires off. Well, that didn't seem to make it better. That's interesting. Try this again. Still got a lot of resistance there, so this is probably no good, which is kind of a bummer. But we're gonna do some more research and come back here. So we'll check back in a bit. We're back on our igniter. Turns out our igniter's bad, it's not usable. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take a razor blade and I'm gonna slice down into the rubber piece here, and I'm gonna pull this rubber piece off and save it. Because you can still get these from Kawasaki new, but they're not specifically for the stand-up. You have to buy it for a 95 TS650. They're like $600, but they don't have this rubber piece here. So we need to preserve this and we'll save this for a later date. The 650 is unique in that the ignition coil is part of it and the CDI is another part. It's all incorporated and it's a very handy package. They did this in the late 80s and this is the only ski they ever did this with. That brings us to our next issue. This ignition was designed in the mid 80s. By the late 80s, by late 1989, 
the FCC, the governing body that, that regulates radio frequency and radio transmissions, they pass legislation called Part 15. It's like CFR 47 Part 15 incidental radiators. If you want to read about it, Google it. It's a long, long read. The gist of it is basically that you as a manufacturer need to manage your own radio frequency transmissions, incidental, intentional, unintentional, or otherwise. So the legal teams at Kawasaki and Yamaha, they were faced with this decision how to deal with incidental radiation of radio frequency transmission. And they both went about it a different way. Neither one is right or wrong. It's just interpretation of the law. To that point is our resistor spark plugs. This I've heard this debate for many years on resistor spark plugs. And basically, this is an NGK. This is a B7ES. What does that mean? If 7 is the heat range. And the fact that there is no R means there's no resistor. This is a BR7. And that means there's a resistor in here. So if we take the voltmeter we put on the spark plug, you can see there's a 4.67 thousand ohm resistor. So if we go to our non-resistor plug, there's no resistance. There's 0.1 ohm. That's almost zero resistance. The B7 is a non-resistor plug. That's why there's no R in it. 7 is the heat range. The 650 motor calls for a 7. The book calls for a 7. So we always use a B7 plug. This is 86, 87, 88, and 89 in the service manuals. They said the B7 spark plug was the one. And we're going to explain why they changed it here in a minute. So now you have a spark plug with 5,000, almost 5,000 ohms of resistance. This spark plug cap here made by NGK, fantastic product. However, there's a resistor built in here as well. We're going to demonstrate that. So see, it's 4.7 thousand ohms of resistance there too. By the time you stack these, and this is OEM Kawasaki, this also has 5,000 ohms of resistance. Yes, these did come after 1990. They were stock on the 650s. But I'm telling you, it wasn't designed for this. So this ignition system was designed for no resistance on the spark plug lead. So this here is a crimp on, and this is a Yamaha. Yamaha did not use resistor spark plug caps either. So we go back to 1989. The FCC puts out legislation that says you need to manage your incidental radiation of radio frequency transmissions. Kawasaki and Yamaha both as corporations, they have legal teams that tell engineers, this is how we need to deal with legislation. This is how we need to do, deal with these new laws. In the future, we know this in hindsight, by 92, they had designed digital ignition systems, which digital ignition systems are sensitive to incidental radiation. Now, I'm gonna show you a video clip here. We were over at Merlin's old school garage the other day, and he was working on Model T's and Model A's a lot lately. Those early ignition systems, that was the infancy of ignition systems. They're bare copper wires that go from the spark plugs to the coil. They emit horrific radiation, noise, and it almost bricked Merlin's GoPro. And we have that footage of what it does to the audio and the video effects of that. We're going to share that now. This is a pretty weak one, actually. It, and then uh, he ground it and tested it. That one's really loud, but it actually has really good spark. That is incidental radiation. That wasn't even a thing back at the turn of the last century. So when they were building cars, that wasn't even an issue. As the 40s and 50s and 60s evolved, car manufacturers handled that stuff mostly in-house. By the 70s and 80s, you had all these cars on the highways creating, generating frequency static, and people sitting in traffic couldn't listen to the radio. So it took an act of Congress, obviously, to change it. That's what incidental radiation is. Kawasaki handled it differently than Yamaha. Kawasaki said, hey, we need to put resistor spark plugs in place, and we need to put resistor spark plug caps in place. That induced 18,000 ohms of resistance into the system. What's going on here under compression, more RPM is greater cylinder pressures inside of there. So the resistance grows through RPM. The engineers at Kawasaki, when they induced 20,000 ohms of resistance in the system, they didn't see it as a problem up to five or 6,000 RPM because the 650 rev limiters come in so low anyway. And they overprop their skis so they never see that RPM. We now know later that we want RPM in our systems. We need them to spin up. With 20,000 ohms of resistance, it blows the spark out. That's why you don't want to run 
a resistor plug or resistor cap. So the best scenario for these is to crimp on a, a spark plug cap like this. If you get these at the auto parts store, there's no resistor in here. And then you get run a B7, a straight B7 NGK spark plug with no resistor. That's gonna give you the best avenue for success with these motors. I've dug through my stash and I found an older 650 igniter. And I wanted to show you guys this because where these marks are, I've taken a grinder here, we grind this down and these spark plug wires slide into, there's a, there's a nail in here for the coil pack. And once you expose that nail and you dig all this out with a grinder, you can actually slide new spark plug wire in, JB weld over top of this. And this igniter is good to go. And we lengthened the wires as well. This was for an X2. Okay guys, I found a good CDI. This is a better CDI. This has the black wire still. This is all OEM. This is our base plate for the electrics. We have our stop switch, right? Straight from the stop switch, straight into the CDI, black and blue. Orange and white from the start switch into the starter relay. We already went through that. We have our ground, our CDI ground, and our CDI hot wire. The ground goes to the shared ground on the uh, rectifier, and this one goes into our stator. This is our stator hot wire there. We have our two yellow wires for the rectifier, which goes right into the rectifier for our charging system. And that's the basic ignition system for the 650. So we should be able to make this thing run. I have our wiring all installed and buttoned up. I hooked up the battery. I unhooked it now, but I hooked the battery up. I smell something. Actually, I can see there's smoke coming out of here. I smell something. I smell electrical burning. That's not a good smell. Oh my. <laughs> so evidently our rectifier was bad and it was sending voltage back in through the uh, ground side on the stator so I don't know if it cooked it or not we're gonna have to pull this back apart and disconnect our rectifier and see if we can figure it out we have it apart again we're gonna check for spark real fast we should be all right on the spark. Yep, spark's okay. The charge coil is usually what takes the beating, so let's do a resistance check on it real fast. So we're getting some resistance, that's a good sign. AC voltage. Okay, we're getting solid voltage. We'll check that again when we get the ski running, but it doesn't look like there was any permanent damage done. Looks like we might have caught it in time, that's positive. So we'll get it back together. This is our bad rectifier. And the way we determined that was, now that we know it's bad, we went ahead and tested it anyway, right? We should have done it before. I should not have assumed it was good, but hey, getting excited about getting the project finished. So the power wire here, and one of these two wires is a dead short. And the other wire is like 1.2 mega ohms or something like that. So the other one's a dead short. So we found this one out of a 91 or newer. And as you can see, it's gonna have different wiring. So we're gonna, there's our two brown wires. Remember, that's our charging system. Those will go to our two yellow. And then we have our hot wires. We'll go, we'll go, the hot wire red goes to orange starter relay over here. We'll translate those and then, it's only got one ground wire, which is the black with the yellow lead. So we're gonna abandon this other black wire. We won't use it. And then we'll try it one more time. Another thing about this, this piece here, when you put it together, see, notice how there's no gap. If there's a gap, it's because you've got a wire pinched under the starter relay. So it's very crucial you don't do that, otherwise you'll, you'll cause more smoke problems down the road. So we don't go through this again. I've got the battery positive here and the battery cable. So we're gonna do a quick amperage check. Look at that. Barely 0 0.01 volts okay. drawing through that. We've managed to make lemonade out of the ignition system. It's ready to go. We're producing spark. We're producing charge for the charging system. Now we're ready to go to the fuel system. This is your fuel pickup here. These screens here, these are your fuel filters. If these are intact and not damaged and not broke, this is your fuel filter. You don't need any other fuel filter. As you add fuel filters to your fuel system, you're inducing resistance. 
That resistance makes the fuel pump work that much harder, and that's why you'll have fuel starvation issues when you start making power. There's a rubber seal that goes between this setup here and the fuel tank. This is critical. These are always missing. I had to go dig one out of my stash because this one was obviously missing too. This is your reserve pickup here. This is, we're only going to use the reserve pickup for the, we're going to go straight to the bottom of the carburetor with this. At the top of this screen, from this point up, it should always pull fuel. So we want to check this because these things are getting to the age where they develop cracks and tiny, tiny cracks you won't be able to see. It'll suck air and it'll wreak havoc when you're trying to troubleshoot. I'll show you how to test this right now. We're going to put this down here in the tank. Wherever this ends up in the fuel tank, we're going to put a Sharpie mark on the outside of the fuel tank. Got that lined up down there. That may not seem important. When we're troubleshooting down the road. It'll, be, it'll become important really quick. All we're going to do is pull vacuum on this. Very simple. Oh, there we go. Now, that's perfect. The fuel stops right about there. It's holding vacuum. I don't know if you can see the fuel, where the fuel is down here, but it's just above the line I drew. So we'll redraw that line. That way, if we're ever out on the water and we're having trouble with our fuel issues, we can look at the Sharpie lines, like, oh, it's below the Sharpie line, we're out of gas. That's why we do this. It's kind of a simple tell, but this is our reserve strainer here. It goes deeper in the tank. We're gonna run this straight to the fuel pump, which is right here. The fuel pump mounts to the side of the hole because of the smaller carburetor. All the other carbs on these skis have built-in fuel pumps on the carburetor. This one here, this one here will go to this pulse line down here on the engine. The suck and blow of the engine pistons going up and down, that produces fuel pump action. Then we're gonna run basically the in to the in, the out to the out, and the out will go to the bottom of the carburetor here. The, the bottom of the carburetor is always fuel in because the top one is the return back to the tank. Not necessarily to return fuel, but to return air. So that's why it's always the top. Air rises, air, you know, air goes to the top and it goes back to the tank. The return will go back in here. And then we're gonna block off one of these because we don't use the on anymore. And then this one here is normally a breather tube, okay? We're not going to use this as a breather tube. We're going to run this fuel line down to the bottom of this fuel, this oil tank. So as the fuel gets used out of this tank here, it'll create a vacuum here and suck the fuel out of our oil tank. We'll put the check valve on the oil tank. Let's see if we get this thing choked and running. Body Beach. We got the 650 down here. We're ready for its maiden voyage. We fired it up and we've already got uh, water flowing through the water system. That turned out good. It starts right up, does everything it's supposed to do. So we're gonna we're gonna go spin it here in a second. We're all reset on our GPS here. Let's try this.
What's up, Tommy? You got a back protector. What do you got on there? What's that? You got a pad on there. That's GoPro. Yeah. I need a drum roll. Oh, 39.9. I have, I have that same one. I had tried so hard to break 40 mile an hour, but... 39.9. <laughs> That's all right, I'll... Uh, you said 49.9. If I turn the carb... Oh, th <laughs> sorry. I, I was going. on the wrong ski. Yeah, I knew you weren't going 50. No. Because these go really go 50. No, nah, that's... I was really hoping for 40 was my goal. So I'm a tenth off. That's okay. Could be the fact that it's a worn out motor. <laughs> worn in. Huh? Worn in. Yes, yes. How right on. That, where do they go in the factory? 35. 36, 37. 35 on the 28 carbs. You look like you're done. I was here at five. You was out here early? Five. Wow. Right on. It's actually pretty quiet right now. I was going to say, it's, t it's totally quiet. Last night was wild, wasn't it? Yeah. It was rough. Yeah, it was cra I haven't seen it that crazy in a long time. All right, guys. We're here with Kevin. Hello, hello. How's it going, Kevin? Good, good. Kevin is a proud owner of this beautiful 650 over here. And while we were checking it out, you notice we have our resistor spark plug caps. And it also has resistor plugs. So Kevin was nice enough to allow us to change them out. We're gonna do a back-to-back -back test here and uh, see the difference it makes. Sure. All, yours. All right. Dude, starts right up. Okay guys, 28.9 is our number to beat. So we'll see if we can do better than that. Right. So you look familiar. I think you bought a 750 from us. Probably. Came to Hampton Inn last year. Oh my goodness. Yeah. Yeah. You bought the... The, the Pro. Yes. Oh dude, that ski is so cool. Did you, did you got it running? Uh, I did get it running. It's not as fast as I'd like it to be. Yeah. That's not a complaint. It's just a lack of time. Was there a, do you remember, was there an issue with the cards or? The pipe was a very unique pipe. Uh -huh. It's made to be water injected. Yeah. Oh, these plugs are hot. Hang on, I gotta, whew. Yeah, CBR ADS. The pipe was made to have water injected in it with an electronic computer. And that computer was long gone. Because the computer was long gone, somebody had taken the water line and shoved it directly in the pipe and was mowing the pipe full of water. So it was so incredibly overwhelmed with water, it couldn't make the horsepower it wanted. So my goal was uh, to get it up to over 50 mile an hour, which was advertised with that pipe, and then and then take it apart and restore it and paint it and everything. Get rid of that Russian camouflage. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I remember it. Yeah, yeah, no, that's, that's awesome. What a good memory. I remembered your Jeep, that's what it was. Yeah, it's hard. <laughs> yeah, that's definitely a unique Jeep, that's for sure. So what do you, you just modify them? No, I'm not modifying anything. All I'm doing is these, these spark plug caps, yeah. If you Google that part number from NGK, you'll see that it's got a resistor in it. It's 5,000 ohms of resistance. These ignition systems aren't designed to push. So if you do 5,000 each hole, that's 10,000. And then the spark plugs are another 10,000 between the two of them. That's 20,000 ohms of resistance. This little ignition can't push that. Now what we're gonna do is we're gonna check this. Oh. This is your check valve, it's it's no good. And they're never any good, they're always bad. Yeah. And I, I didn't bring any zip, you don't have any zip ties, do you? I do not. Okay, that's all right. Let's see here, I'm gonna give this to you. Because... Okay. Yeah. Remember your old 7, 750? Yeah. You got it running. All right, there we go. I'm so glad you guys didn't give up on the ski. That was my biggest you fear. What it was? Can you tell them real quick? Yeah, yeah, you bet. 
I'm going to leave all this with you. There you go. So what that is, that's got an arrow on it. Yeah. The arrow goes towards the tank, just like your stock one does. Okay. It's a check valve. It lets air into the tank, but doesn't let air out. Gotcha. Well, your, your exhaust pipe? That exhaust pipe was a high-end pipe. Yeah. It's made to have a computer inject water into it. Oh, wow. That computer went bad, and when they took the computer off and threw it away, they took the water line that was hooked up to the pulsing system, yeah. and they plugged it directly on the pipe. So it was mowing the water with so much pipe it couldn't make horsepower. Wow. Were the cards okay on them? Yeah, it was so overpropped, the ski would have never ran. Wow. Like, you can't put a tall prop on a ski like that. That the motor can't rev up. I was wondering, did I do it? No, you did a great no, you did a great job. Yeah, I, I never touched them. Okay guys, I'm not gonna bother resetting my GPS because if it doesn't go any faster, it isn't gonna matter. <laughs> it may not anyway. The thing felt really overpropped. But I'm hoping that it was just the ignition pushing past that. But we'll see. It, it's there's a it'll be obvious. It's not like it's gonna be a mystery here. We'll know right away. Perfect. Alrighty, I'll be right back. Bye. Yes, it felt faster. Yeah. But let's see, the proof is in the GPS. It don't lie. It looked like you took off quicker. <laughs> a quarter mile an hour. Quarter mile an hour. Let me see here. All right, I reset my GPS. Let's try it again. It looked like it took off. The it looked no, it felt faster. The wind was blowing harder on me. I'm like, okay, well, it's it's faster. <laughs> Two mile an hour. Hey, it makes a difference. Yeah, it does. Okay guys, we finally got back to the trailer here and uh, looks like we're 31.1, which is only two mile an hour, but on a 30 mile an hour ski, that's almost 10%. So we'll take it. See, we've, we've come back from the beach and everything looks pretty good. There's a lot of water in the bottom there. I didn't really take the hood off at all the whole time we were there. Guess I should have done that and checked it out. Water's coming from somewhere. We'll have to do a little bit of research into that and find out why. That'll be easy to solve. I just I should have been a lot easier at the beach, but that's okay. I was still kind of shocked at our 39.9 mile an hour. That'll be it for now. We have other plans. We're going to put a bigger car. We're going to put a bigger pipe. We're going to do some fun stuff with this ski. It's definitely going to be a part of the channel for a while. Couldn't be any happier. I mean, 40 mile an hour, that's pretty much where I kind of figured it would end up. I mean, bone stock, that's not bad at all. The other ski that was down there, bone stock, uh, that's an average for a ski that's out, out in the world, out in the public. What just what we did was a couple mile an hour. All those little tricks I showed you guys over the course of these videos, if he was to do all that, he would be up to 38, 39 mile an hour just as easily. So that being said, thanks for watching.